Welcome to another episode of the Fashion Masters Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about perception versus reality. And Deanna, you just came back from an amazing trip, which was part of the Holistic Leadership Council. And I'm, I have secondhand excitement for <laughs> everything that you just experienced and have caught me up on. Um, I just got back from a very long trip as well. Very different trips though. Yeah. Yours was more business health related. Mine was one of my best buddies bachelor party, but we are hiking mountains and doing some interesting things. So I'm a, I'm a little tired to say the <laughs> least, but let's jump right in because this is a very interesting topic, a very interesting conversation. I love this kind, this kind of topic. So let's just hop on right in. So uh, just one of the first things I want to share from my experience at the council was Tom McCarthy, who is an incredible leader, author, teacher he he's just fantastic and he was doing this presentation to us where he was sharing that five percent of our conscious brain only is really what's doing the work of our day 95 percent of our day is driven through our subconscious mind and then under that layer there's the superconscious mind so he was teaching us that it's really not our conscious mind directing our actions our perception of life it's the subconscious mind and so we, we did this little experiment and it was lovely because I actually broke through that board. It was so much fun. Like we had to write our limiting beliefs. We had to write how we wanted to change it. And then on the flip side, we had to write something on the board that we wanted to crush through. And it was just so satisfying because I did it and it broke and was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Hmm. But what I loved what he was saying is that whether we actually experience something for real or we see it on a movie, or we read it in a book, or we have thoughts from the past, that's our perception. The reality is often very different than what we're perceiving. And I love this conversation because he talked about limiting beliefs. So if I believe that I don't deserve to have abundance in my life, or I don't deserve to have a great love in my life, or I don't deserve to have a beautiful, healthy body, then that's the information you're putting out into the world to magnetize that reality into your body. But that's not the reality, that's the perception. But then we magnetize that perception into our lives and experience it as reality. So it was so fascinating because, I mean, even him saying like, you know, when you're dreaming, like dream big, don't limit mm -hmm. yourself. So as I'm writing this big vision I had, it, it's even wild because part of you as you're writing it kind of like, could I? And then, and so, suddenly you break through it. So I'm, I'm very excited about what's to come with our company and with everything that we're doing, because I feel like I have a very new intention that I'm magnetizing into what we're doing. And I just really want people to understand how we can do that and how profound it is. But what I really want to relate that to, to fascia is the realization that we have a very different physiology when we're a diaphragmatic breather compared to when we're an upper chest breather. So the diaphragmatic breather connects us to a certain brain frequency that connects us to the moment. God lives in the moment. The upper chest breather connects us to a frequency that connects us to our ego of past and future, which is where fear lives. I like using the acronym for fear, false energy, acting real, because if we're afraid of something, like I'm afraid of certain things, you're afraid of certain things, they're not the same things, but our... But why, why is... Why is fear specific to you and fear specific to me? Yes, because that's how we all made programmed. Right. So it's false energy, but we feel that it's real. Like if I'm afraid of that spider or afraid of heights or afraid of, you know, being held down, those are all from patternings or experiences from the past. So that literally ties in to perception versus reality. Exactly. And I mean, even, even the fact that, okay, like if my body is... If, if I feel like my body is attacking me instead of supporting me, mm. and, and we're also, I think, given a lot of that information through the information that we're looking outward for to try to help us find our, our balance and our center, because we're all locked into this paradigm of believing these things. So the really cool part that I really want to emphasize is that, yes, we are a body with parts, but we're also this beautiful fluid matrix that's interconnected. We are literally fluid. We're made up of 70% water um, around, you know, whatever the amount is exactly. But when we look at our body as a container with parts, then we have a very different understanding of what can happen to the body with injury. 
you know, like you think of a bone breaking and then you think of a twig breaking it in half. So the understanding of how to heal that bone when you're thinking it from that perspective is a very different conversation than when we can heal that bone from the reality that we are also this fluid matrix. Right. And it's through understanding how to change the game with your breathing that we can actually turn the body into this warm, beautiful container that houses our soul that is designed to allow us to thrive, to regenerate, to experience life on such a grand level of love and peace. Yet we're stuck in this container where we're looking outward and we're cold and we're brittle and we're fighting war with war, right? Mm. You know, so, um, yeah, I just thought this was such a fascinating conversation to be had right now because um, I feel like I've just come back a refreshed human. I feel like I've awakened this like childlike excitement now, like all of the responsibilities that I felt with doing this work and growing this company. I mean, it was heavy. It's like we, we've got a lot on our plate. But now I, the, the thing that I broke through was fatigue because it's, it's, wow, that's huge. It's huge because it's like mind numbing to think like, how do I do all of these things? But now there's just the trust. I broke through it. So now I'm just, I, I feel like literally we're magnetizing in and all these opportunities literally since the other day, since I got home are already starting to come at us and surface. And so now I truly feel like we're going to be helping a billion people on this planet find their breath, find their ability to thrive in life and not be afraid anymore. We are safe inside ourselves if we allow ourselves to connect to that inner breath, that inner child, that love piece. And what was really cool, um, the very first evening we were there, we did this opening ceremony and I, I've never experienced anything quite so beautiful and profound. It was this whole ceremony with all of us where there was these three incredible women singing and talking about the culture, the Mayan culture. And there's five elements. There's, there's earth, water, air, fire, and the fifth element is space. Hmm. And love is where love lives within the space. So as she's sharing this, I'm just like tingling inside because our entire work is about creating internal space. Hmm. So the more space we have within, the more love that we're connected to, the more love we exude that magnetize, and then the more love that comes back. So we can really understand this magnetic being that we are. What we throw out comes back. If I'm hating my body, that's going to come back. That was my experience when I was in my 20s and I was 50 pounds overweight, riddled with stress. I hated my body. And the more I hated it, the more it became something to hate. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And this is like the base conversation around this comes down to quantum physics. And when I was on the plane, I was listening to, and I, I only got maybe 20 minutes in, but it was Bruce Lipton and Aubrey Marcus. And I just love them both. You introduced me to Bruce Lipton uh, once upon a time, but they were really distinguishing the difference between Newtonian physics and quantum physics. And how did it really come to be? And like, in the most simple forms, it's just seeing that energy affects matter. It a hundred percent does. Everything is energy. It's not matter necessarily. So with that understanding, if your thoughts are energy, then your thoughts can change matter. And that's that statement alone is the most powerful statement I think you can almost hear because you could have the perception of doing block therapy and it could be negative and you would be like, this isn't going to help me get out of pain. You might get a rib release, all these negative connotations around it. And you know what? It's probably not going to be to the positive experience of what it could be if you had a positive perception around it. And then you can turn that into a positive reality. So it's, it's with everything, with the food you eat. If you think that certain foods you're going to eat are going to be bad for you, then they're going to be bad for you and they might actually be nutritious for you and vice versa. If you're eating unhealthy food, but you actually truly believe and, and sure this comes in layers. It's not just saying, okay, this pizza is going to be good for me. It's really breaking through that subconscious where you get to this new understanding of truly, truly believing that. And it really comes down to just how many walls can you break through? Because when I was focusing on rebuilding my subconscious mind because we're all messed up. We really are. 
since day one or being programmed. And it really starts with your environment as well. And all of these experiences and these traumas, capital T, lower T traumas that keep on accumulating. And then once you make the conscious decision to change your subconscious mind, that's where a, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of work, but absolutely everything in your life changes. And that's where you can start to manifest things. That's where you can start to heal your body on a completely different level. I've healed like uh, not necessarily massive issues, but a lot within myself through meditation, through block therapy, through finding the combination of certain things. But everything just comes down to intention as well, because your thoughts carry that energy. So if I have the proper intent behind doing block therapy, eating, um, meditating, whatever it is, that is going to literally change the reality of the outcome. Exactly. I mean, so well put. And what I love yesterday, I was on our community call and somebody asked the question, if I've had this injury from 30, 40 years ago, will I be able to heal it? Is it going to take longer because I'm older, because the injury is older? So that was a bit of a loaded question because there's a lot of different answers to that. But the basic answer is it's, if, if you look at the, like the time space continuum, right? There's no time, there's no space. I mean, like we're all in this strange moment of understanding time and space, but when you realize that there is no time or space, suddenly do you need 40 years to heal an injury from 40 years ago as an example? So when you understand turning your body as a container with parts into a fluid matrix, mm. if I have an ice cube that's been in the freezer for 20, 30, 40 years, or an ice cube that I put in the freezer last night, when I take it out of the freezer, they both melt. doesn't matter how old the ice cube is. Mm. So when we start to understand that right now we're cold, like in general, people's overall body temperature is colder than it should be. So Especially the extremities. Exactly. So as a result of that, when we have injury, when we have dis-ease, sickness, trauma, whatever it is, we are having to figure out from this cold body how to repair it and the process that traditionally we use to repair it is based on that model of understanding mm. but when we suddenly can realize wow we can actually heat up our overall body's internal temperature through connecting to that diaphragmatic breath it's the body's furnace compared to the upper chest breath being like the space heater or another analogy is it's the inboard that powerful inboard motor of the boat compared to a trolling motor. I mean, what do you want to drive your life with this weaker motor that's not designed to drive your entire system? It's designed to go fishing and be nice and, and you know, not overly loud so the fish don't get scared away and, and not to power you. So when we understand how to shift that and make this muscle the main focus of how we view health and what we do with our life and our time from an exercise perspective, from a self-care perspective, then we can very quickly start to heat up the body. And then all of these timelines of injuries from the past, it creates a different quantum type of healing mm. because we're warmer. And as soon as it's warmer, again, I can, I can reach my toes. And again, we shared so many before and after pictures um, in, in our community anyway that, that show what people are doing. And this weekend, I had everybody working between their toes. So this is really cool too, because of course we also have a pet program. So Dr. Marlene Siegel, who's partnered with me in the um, fascia decompression for the pets, mm -hmm. she was also at this council, which is actually where I met her initially. So now um, I'm working on everybody there. I'm working on between their toes. I'm teaching them to do this. So as we're driving back, she's like, well, we can work between the toes of the dogs too. And I'm like, try it. She sends me a video last night after doing work with this one dog who was very, very um, asymmetrical, had all these different issues. And again, just holy smokes, like mm -hmm. the change immediately from bringing that energy and that life back into the extremities. I, I actually just kind of out of the blue said last night, and I love the comment, the, the limbs are the puppet strings for the core. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So when we can, that's great. Yeah. So to, to be able, and, and again, that's, that, a, that's, that's, the basis of the idea of scoliosis too. Exactly. Which is another conversation. Yeah. So when we can 
we can look at the body and for somebody with a migraine to think, why would I work on my feet? The perception is mm. it's too far away. I need mm. to work where I hurt that's, to make it that's impactful. A very good point. But the reality is, is we are a fluid matrix interconnected together and we have to look at what is holding us back from that flow. And it's, it's the hands and the forearms and the, the feet and the calves. It's those extremities. And even like, again, reflexology is based off of working in the feet to help other areas of the body. And the hands. And the he right. And the hands. And the ears. Okay. So you know more about this than I do. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but to that point, yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. And even the perception of aging, like this is something that's been imprinted to us since day one. Happy birthday. You're three years old now. Happy birthday. Oh, you entered your teens. Oh, you're 25 or 30 or 40. It's literally a ticking time bomb that we're all kind of waiting for. Where if we, I'm not saying don't celebrate a birthday. We all celebrate our birthday, but just the idea and the understanding and the perception, knowing that, oh, the average person dies at around, I'm going to make this number up 72 or 68, whatever it is, then you're, you're almost pre-planning your death as dark as that sounds you you are to an extent but if we really understood the body we were trained at a young age to understand um how powerful the mind is to change our reality proper whole foods creating space in the body oxygenating the body properly connecting to the earth, all these things then i don't even think that would be a conversation of when are we going to die um, so the whole idea of aging, oh, like I'm, I'm even thinking about it too. Like I'm, I'm almost 30 and a year from now I'm going to be 30. And to some people you're like, oh, Quinn, you're super young. But at the same time, it's like, you don't ever think that you're going to reach 30 or you're going to reach 40 or 50, 60, 70. It just seems so far away, but it comes very quick. It does. So if you keep thinking that way, then you're literally going to almost accelerate your, your death and decelerate that's a word, your happiness in a way. And you, you want to just be able, like, uh, the Brian Johnson guy, he's saying like, with all of this information now, um, he's predicted to live to like 200 years old. That's insane. That is insane. Um, and I think he's doing a lot of amazing things, but I think there's a lot of amazing things he could incorporate in as well. Point being is don't get caught up in, in the number. Don't get caught up in the in your age get caught up in the idea of living in the present and that you can change your reality with a snap of your fingers if you make that conscious decision and what's really cool about that whole death conversation and i love this is ultimately in the world that we understand right now and here what is it that causes us to die it's compression over time and a slow lack of oxygen. Yeah. So it's the compression that creates that. Though eventually we squeeze the life out of the cells. Eventually the heart stops and then we expire. So to be decompressing, what does that mean? Mm. You know, this is the exciting part because here we are in this world now where, you know, one, one, of, one of the things that I'm so passionate about and now as a result of this last weekend, I know we're going to be able to get those tendrils out into the world are the kids mm. because, and, and here's the reality, not the perception. The kids are older today than the older people. They're, they have less space in their body already coming out. So when we're born into this lifetime, we're born with our mother's breath. My mother's breath was different than your mother's breath. Your, so my sister, mm whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the 30 year old or the 25 year old today has a very different breath because we grew up in a very different way. So then the babies coming out of the mothers today have their breath and then they are compressed with gravity and all of the other things from that time. So because we've, we've evolved and devolved in the ways that we've had, we've evolved in technology, we've devolved in health. Our bodies are not working right anymore. The kids are showing it. They are riddled with issues with scoliosis. They are hard to palpate. They don't have soft tissue. They're not mm. coming out breathing diaphragmatically. So they are literally older in tissue than the older people. And that's, it, it, it's an interesting conversation because, I mean, somebody might say, well, that doesn't make any sense, but it's all about 
health. So how long can the person that has space in their body that allows gravity to not direct how they age, but they can defy gravity through that full conscious exhalation and continue to go through time mm -hmm. without compression and in fact decompress to bring life back into areas previously blocked? You know, how long will we actually age? Like that's a question to be answered in the future. Mm -hmm. But that's exciting because this is what it we're is doing exciting. in this time. And there's like that whole debate on would you rather live 40 or 50 years of like pleasure, fun, no pain, n not slowly aging and not being able to do the things you love or live to 100, but half of those years are going to be somewhat terrible. Now, why, why can't we live to 100, 200 years where all of the years are just great? And I, I really do see this as being a possibility, especially with the technology, not even just the technology. It's really just waking up now mm -hmm. and understanding what the body truly needs. And there's like, this is such a loaded conversation and question, but like from sleep to stress, to anxiety, to like all of these things, if we were just taught or if we can just do some research and understand how to manage that properly. Because I've had a, that's, that's my biggest, uh, downfall is stress and anxiety. And I didn't realize that I had chronic stress and anxiety, but that can cause issues within my body. And that's just how I was born. That's how I was like, that's what made me really good at things because it, it was the, uh, what's, what's the, what's the term like sure a perfectionist, but I was just so, I was so driven. I didn't view it as anxiety. I didn't know what that even meant. I think what would be really cool is for people to kind of reflect on themselves after listening to the bulk of this podcast and finding certain areas where they really feel limited. What, where is this big roadblock coming from? Because you mentioned the big thing that you came from, or from the outcome of this whole experience was you kind of took fatigue out of the way. Yeah. For you, what else did you necessarily break through? I broke through the, I remember being this very young kid with this incredible spirit. And then there was some things that happened to me that cut that cord. So going forward, I didn't feel that I could truly express that powerful young kid. I felt like I had to dim my light mm. for a number of reasons and that dimming of the light created a lot of confusion yet I was still driven to excel but I would self-sabotage I sabotaged many opportunities in my life because there was just so much chaos and and you know it's it's interesting too because I've had so many people reach out to me over the years talking about you know wow you must feel so so excited and and great because of all the people that you're helping and I could intellectualize it, but I couldn't really feel it in my heart because the, the burden of the business, you know, like I, I didn't actually go into this to start a business. I went into it to help people, but if you want to help people, you have to start a business. And I mean, that's a very, very, I mean, we know, man, like we've, we've been living through years of, of building it and it can be incredibly exhausting and challenging. And, you know, you think, okay, I'm about to take a holiday and then something crashes. It's like, sorry, no, you got to be present for your company. Mm -hmm. So what's in the best interest of the company is always what runs in my head first. But it was at the expense of the, the joy of the work of the purpose of the mission. So I just felt like I was almost like a soldier driving forward as opposed to a child enjoying the journey and the process where I feel like that weight of the responsibility now has been lifted because that responsibility was exhausting. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to get this work into as many hands as, as possible. So that, thought before was exhausting because it's like I mean we're already growing and it's it's a lot so how do we how do we keep doing that and still maintain some space for our lives and that was what I was so grateful for for you because literally you came out of high school you dove right in with me and then we dove into tech messes and I remember how I, I knew I knew very early on that I chose my perfect partner in you because there were those moments when we didn't know what we were doing. And I mean, I can't do a thing. So it's all on you. And I remember those moments when you were staying up till the wee hours of the morning, trying to figure out how to fix things. And you were relentless. 
And, you know, that was that kid in you that would like go and play hockey and want to be the best and everything. You were relentless and you brought that into this work. And that's why a decade later, here we are. And now, I mean, we still have tons to do, but like what you have built in that back end because of that relentless work. So I was so excited because now, and, and I remember us talking along the way where I would always share with you because I didn't do it. And I didn't want you to go through what I went through for those decades where we have to plan our lives to have those parts of joy in them because we will never not have enough to do. And if we put it on us that we always have more, 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 when do we ever get to take that moment to enjoy life? So, you know, now I see that you're actually starting to do that and, and travel. So for you to have had just this incredible experience that you did, mm. you know, it was like, that's what you need to do. That's what we all need to do. But you're doing this now. And point being that now I'm excited because now it's like, okay, where like a couple of years ago in my mind, it would have been like, I can't take this time off right now. I can't, yeah. I can't. Yeah. And, and it's the guilt behind it too. Yeah. I think that's actually a big thing too, is if you can learn to let go of the guilt within nearly everything, you want to have a cheat meal. Well, if there's just guilt based around that, that's going to manifest into something a lot worse. And if you were just to accept that food and just say, I'm going to enjoy this yeah. and your body's going to receive that food a lot differently than if you're going to say like, this is terrible for me. I know all like all the chemicals the heavy metals the processed food all this and what it's going to do to my body just just accept it and i think and that's an an important thing like even if you're out and about in any scenario like for example that was i was gone for 12 days who plans a 12-day bachelor party <laughs> like it was absolutely ridiculous and we were in patagonia uh chile and then miami and the food was just very different. Like I'm very strict with like my nutrition, my routine, and you have to just not have that guilt. You drink a lot of wine when you're on these trips. Like it's, it's exhausting because you're hiking all day, doing all these excursions. Then you come back, you eat foreign food, you're drinking wine, then you're up early and you do it again. It's like, you need a week to recover from this. <laughs> but I guess my point being here is, when you're in those scenarios, don't have some negative um, self-sabotage You have to, or any negative communication to the food or even the wine or anything. Like If you can just be positive about it, that changes the, the chemistry within your body so that it's not going to feel as negative as maybe that frequency of the food or that experience, experience holds. You can always transmute that into something positive. And I think on that point too... I, I think like that just brought up that memory. Like when I was in my twenties and a total mess, you know, I'd go to a movie and I would buy a family size pack of M&Ms and I would eat the whole thing, but I didn't enjoy one because right from the get go, it was guilt. So I'm throwing them into my mouth. I knew I was going to finish the bag. I didn't chew them. I didn't even really taste them. And I just swallowed them. And then <laughs> I know, I know it's wild. And then at the end of it, you're like, okay, so, and, and then you're thinking calories. That's another yeah, perception yeah, yeah. versus reality conversation that we don't have to have now. But, mm. um, you know, I probably just, you know, consumed 4,000 calories of chemical garbage and there wasn't one moment of enjoyment from it. So now what I do is I don't, act. if I want something, I'll eat it or drink it, but I enjoy it. I put it in my mouth and I chew it. Mm. And that was the first thing when I started talking about, like, we really need to chew our food. Because if you try chewing and you let that food become liquid in your mouth and it's chemical as mm. opposed to healthy, now you taste it. Yeah. I didn't taste the chemical. I didn't taste the bad stuff because I didn't even chew it. I just swallowed it. Yeah, that's pretty wild. No wonder I was a fan of it. It's it's also interesting, like if you do a cleanse or just yeah, I'll keep it simple to a cleanse. And then you go back to eating your regular diet, quote unquote. You just, you taste everything so different now. You can taste the hidden chemicals and things. You can taste things that might feel more or taste more metally. Yeah. I remember when I was eating primarily game meat, either elk or venison. And then I decided to like cook up a store-bought steak from a cow. It tasted completely different than from what I remembered. It just tasted like almost chemically. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't really explain it, but um, so we don't know what's really hidden in the foods until you take a break from those foods and revisit them in the future. 
Yeah. And, and too, like another thing that that brought to mind is, you know, when somebody tells you this food is good for you, um, you eat it because somebody told you this food mm -hmm. is good for you. But the reality is, is how do you feel with it? Right. Like if you don't feel good with it, then it might be good for this person, but it might not be good for you. Right. And I, I've also had so many experience with, with experiences with people over the years that felt really great in their body, went and got a diagnosis and then started feeling bad. Mm. You know, like, again, y you feel good. Like, what's the point of being here? It's to feel good and thrive. So when somebody tells you that, you know, you're not feeling good and then you start believing it, then you actually don't feel good. Mm. So 100%. Yeah, it's very, very accurate. So if that's the reality, then why can't we just flip the script and just say, let's say you are sick. I should say, no, you're feeling good. You're good. I feel good. A lot of it can be caused from your subconscious mind, from all this accumulation over your lifetime. And then boom, you get sick. But what really caused you to get sick? And again, it doesn't happen overnight to reprogram your subconscious mind, but when you first start, I like, I also feel, feel like once you feel different from the work that you're putting in, then it starts to get exponential. Yeah. And that was the biggest thing. I didn't know what it felt like to feel calm. And when I started to actually experience what it was like to feel calm, I'm like, is this what, am I closer to being to quote unquote normal? And that was an incredible feeling because now I had a new baseline or at least I had a reference point of what less anxiety or no anxiety felt like. So then I could, if I fell off and I had more anxiety again, at least I knew what it felt like to feel like having less anxiety. And you can do that with pretty well everything. And that was the biggest thing. Like if you can manage your sleep, stress and anxiety, that alone, your life is going to start to change right away. And to flip the script, there's a lot of things, but if you don't change your breath, you don't change the frequency in your brain, you don't connect to the parasympathetic nervous system so you can go into that healing space and then you stay locked into the patterns of behavior which are driven through the patterns of fascia, those grooves that we always talk about that we fall into, those scripts are connected to the physical body. It's not just repatterning re your brain, but you can't repattern your brain without repatterning your body, mm. your, your fascia, because the pattern of what we've fallen into is held and locked with gravity. Right. We need to unlock that patterning, bring a new pattern back in. And, you know, like, that that whole thought of manifesting like okay i'm gonna make a million dollars so i'm gonna close my eyes and believe it and tomorrow i'm gonna have a million dollars the thing that we have to do is we need action right so we can't just think something we have to think it also know that it's real but also realize that okay if i actually really want to create change action is needed but what's neat is when you magnetize your belief about it then the opportunities come to you but action still needs to be taken. Yeah. If you're unhealthy and you can see yourself being in this beautiful, healthy, awesome body, but you don't change anything, you're not going to get there. A hundred percent. And that's, and, and the formula of manifesting can be used for like pretty much anything. That's what's really cool about it. So for example, you're talking about the formula. So the intention is sending the signal out. The emotion that you already have that thing is drawing it in. So you need both of those. And then the action is what, like, this is real life. We, we need to take action. We are in the 3D world for a reason. Yeah. So we need to be a part of that. The point isn't just to be spiritual and just in your head kind of thing. You, you need to experience all of it. So another point of what you're just talking about is there is, there's been incredible transform transformations and healings that have happened through just meditation, but there's also a massive limiting factor because if let's say I shattered my ankle or I broke my ankle or like any issue in the body and I just start to really manifest and send all this healing and put all this intention to that without doing anything physical, you will, you will make progress, but you have to still understand that we are extremely physical as well. And we need to go in and unlock and assist that. So now imagine 
if you're doing block therapy or any sort of um, somatic modality, then integrate that in with an intention. Almost manifest what you want the outcome to be while incorporating the physical, um, the physical practice of it and see what happens. Absolutely. It's, it's, that is a whole new level of where magic happens. Yes. So you can hear from Joe Dispenza. People are going into a seven day meditation and blind people can see, deaf people can hear. Stage four cancer is gone. Not my words, his words. Mm -hmm. Now imagine taking that or at least the idea of that and combining that with a physical practice, the breath, grounding, like once you get this all together. Well, and I think the difference too being that I believe fully that we can have these spontaneous healings, but what creates the dis-ease in the first place is the adhesions and the scar tissue. Exactly. So you might have it in the moment, but what is life like a year from now, 10 years from now, if you don't change that physical because body, mind, and spirit travel together. 100%. So if we don't do those things to allow everything to travel together, then I can see us going back into the old patternings of, okay, now I'm creating that blockage in my ears again, and now it's going to like cause deafness totally. or whatever yeah. it is. You're absolutely right. And even like a part of my brain goes towards, you can trigger this internal chemistry to heal your body. But if you have physical blockages, that's going to slow down that opportunity. So that's where I see it. Like if you have a massive scar or a massive adhesion or collapse in the body. Now, I believe that you can release a lot of tension through meditation and through breath work in your fashion throughout your entire body. But if you have these massive physical barricades, it's going to be much more difficult. I would say I'm not going to say it's impossible because I'm no master in meditation, but all like our whole point here is you need to do the both. You need to do both. Like if your intention is meditation to heal something, well, incorporate that in with the physical. And even if you just start with the physical, that's going to regardless help to some extent. I also think another perception people have is, you know, the, the idea that if I'm 60 years old right now and I want to look like I did when I was 35 or go through that anti reverse aging process, whatever you want, you want to call it you think that you want to look like that pre-version of you. Mm. And it's not like that, right? When we actually start doing this work, we can, like, I don't want to look like I did in my 20s. <laughs> like, I, I, I very much more appreciate this container I'm living in far more than in my 20s. And that's the point. When we understand cellular alignment and driving the breath to all of the cells, what we even envision as a younger version of ourselves is a completely different mm reality than or perception anyways i'm lost in the words but point yeah. being change happens on a quantum level when you combine all of this work together and it's just so very exciting because now that i've come back from this incredible holistic leadership council opportunity meeting all these amazing people and seeing all of the contributions and their wisdom to bringing more healing into the world now we're going to be bringing it all together for everybody to share. And this is where things are going to get exciting. Yeah. That exponential yeah. one plus one plus one equals like a million. That's some good math. Thanks. <laughs> I was always good at math. No, I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, I feel like we could do many podcast episodes specifically on perception versus reality and really segment it into specific topics within this general idea. Um, so I think that's probably a good place to wrap up. Yeah. I love this and I'm excited to brainstorm with you different topics around this idea so that we can like, I, I really like these conversations. Me too. This, this excites me a lot. More to come. And, um, yeah, then let's just wrap it up here. Thank you very much for tuning in. And again, if you just want to experience fashion decompression for yourself, uh, you can check out our YouTube channel. You can also check out our sampler program. It's $9 for nine videos. We teach you how to use a rolled up towel so you don't have to commit to our actual block and our starter program. And yeah, just follow us. If you like hearing us and what we have to say, then we really appreciate you being here and any um, future episode ideas. We, we love hearing them because this is what fuels us as well. Yeah. So leave that in the comments below or email us or contact us. Other than that, We'll see you in next week's podcast. Bye, everyone.